All right, well, good morning. Oh, there you go. Everybody's awake. My name's Walt Tanner, one of the pastors here at Capstone. Uh, and we, today we are finishing up our From This Day Forward series, which has been about relationships and also in the idea of marriages and how do we just not survive a global pandemic in our marriages, but how do we thrive? Like, how are our marriages pandemic proof and we haven't been giving you five things to have the best marriage or how to sprinkle some Jesus in your marriage to, to kind of make it better but the idea is is that marriage won't work unless Christ is the center of your love story that, that, that marriage won't work unless Christ is at the center of your love story. And yes, you can live together. And yes, you can coexist, you can coexist together and you can co-parent. But the idea that you have this intimate, uh, soul-entangling, physical, attractional, just as a beautiful piece of the covenant of marriage in which God intended and literally created you for can't happen unless we have that. And so as we move forward and we've been going through this series, just looking back and going, look, we can't, we can't change the first five years of marriage. We can't change the, the last 10 years of marriage. We can't change the last six months and the stuff that you guys have said to one another while you've been in quarantine. But from this day forward, we can move. From this day forward, we can begin to, how do we recenter Christ at our marriages? Or for those of you that, that aren't married and are, aren't in a, a, a marriage covenant, the idea of going, hey, when I do get there, what should I be looking for? What should our marriage be? be centered on? What should that foundation look like? We have this main theme of going, look, marriages won't get better when we stop fighting with our spouse, but when we begin to fight our, fight, uh, fight our own hearts for our spouse by having a Christ-centered relationship. So it's not, it's not going to get better when we just stop fighting, which we're going to talk more about that in a second. But the idea of going, man, it's when I begin fighting my own heart against my own flesh, my own wants, my own desires, and begin to die not only to myself, to reflect Christ, but begin to die even to my spouse. Because Christ, he said, look, he said, you're meant to have relationships. That is important. He, he put inside of you the desire to be in a relationship with people. But there's, there's vertical relationship and horizontal relationship. And a lot of times we get this backwards. We think, well, we'll just, we'll just get married and we'll raise kids. And, and then we'll kind of get this whole Jesus thing. But Jesus said, no, no, I've got to be first and, and work on that horizontal relationship. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And then it will affect and overflow into your horizontal relationships. But too many of us don't focus on that, that vertical relationship of our relationship with the Father. And so we said, look, we got to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. That, that if you want to be good parents, seek first His kingdom. If you want to be a good spouse, seek first His kingdom. If you want to be a good neighbor, seek first His kingdom. And all these things will be added unto you. So today, kind of the original plan was that we were going to have Zach and Ashley Dixon uh, come and join us. And Zach is a part of Hope Town Counseling, and he was at a marriage retreat we did about a year and a half ago up in Asheville. And he's from Fountain Inn. He's OG 44. Like he was born and raised here in Fountain Inn. Now lives in Anderson and, and has established uh, Hope um, um, Hope Town Counseling there. And our goal was to have him and Ashley come share and as a therapist, a marriage therapist, and just kind of counseling and, and kind of the background of what that would look like. But through the pandemic, he's not able to join us. And like I told him, you know, 2020, pretty much everything's in pencil. All right, there's nothing written in pen. And so we weren't able to have him here with us, but he, I did ask him to, to do a video and, and share a few moments, one of saying, if you were here, you know, just, just how would you talk to our Capstone family? But then also, hey, how, how can you give them tools? How can you best equip them uh, as, pe as someone who's sitting across the table from those who are struggling in marriage and, and even in his own relationship, his own marriage, what that looks like? So we're going to start the morning off by Zach's going to share a few words with us, then we'll come back uh, and we'll finish up the series. Good morning, Capstone if you don't know me, my name's Zach Dixon. Some of you may remember me from Marriage Conference, which seems like decades ago at this point. Um, or some of you may know me from the Roman the Halls of Hillcrest High School, um, or rollerblading down Quillen Avenue. Yes, I rollerbladed in middle school, played elementary school. And if I'm being honest, I miss those days. Um, but either way, I don't know why I'm talking about that right now. Either way, uh, it's good to be with you through the cell phone, through video. This morning, Walt and I tried. Uh, we've been trying to work it out uh, for me to come there and Chris. Uh, and obviously, we didn't know the world was going to lose its mind this year. Um, 
but uh, this was the best we could do today. Um, but I do, uh, I, I do really, not to make it over spiritual, I long to be with y'all in person more, um, even ever since um, marriage conference. And even before that, just, I mean, some of my best friends are uh, a part of Capstone. And um, I really am, like, I'm thankful for y'all. I said this to the ones that came to the conference. I'm so thankful for y'all. And, and again, I'm not trying to be hyper spiritual today or overly spiritual, but um, I wrote down this passage of scripture in Philippians when Paul talks about um, the church of Philippi, where he talks to them in his letter. Um, it's kind of how I feel. Again, I'm not trying to be uber spiritual, but this is just how I feel about Capstone Church. He says, every time I think of you, I thank God. This is because you have taken part with me in spreading the good news from the first day you heard about it. God is the one who began this good work in you, and I am certain that he won't stop before it's complete on the day that Christ returns. You have a special place in my heart, Paul says. Isn't that just sweet? Uh, so it is only natural for me to feel the way I do. All of you have helped me in the work God has given me as I defend the good news and tell about it here in jail. God himself knows how much I want to see you. I do. I'd rather see you in person than over the technology, but nonetheless. Um, he knows I care for you in the same way Christ Jesus does. I pray that your love will will keep on growing and you will fully know and understand how to make the right choices. Then you will stand, or then you will still be pure and innocent when Christ returns. And until that day, Jesus Christ will keep you busy doing good deeds that bring glory and praise to God. So I say that just to say, uh, to encourage you to keep going. Um, and we are almost, I, I really feel it in my gut, we are almost through with this pandemic. If we can just uh, get in, past these next few months, and I know we can, um, even though I can't find toilet paper again, and I'm really frustrated about that. Um, but really quickly, um, Walt asked me just to share um, a quick uh, video uh, or a quick encouragement. He gave me free reign, um, but I thought it would be good and necessary to talk about conflict. And I know that's what my session was uh, when y'all came to Winter Conference, so let this be a reminder. Paul gave a bunch of reminders, um, and I need reminders, and so I hope that this is helpful for you. And God knows we have had some conflict in 2020, right? Whether it is an election year, whether it's over politics or uh, wearing a mask or or racial uh, upheaval, um, it it has been filled with conflict a lot of conflict and, and it's been exhausting and to the point where I had to get off social media because um, I was losing my mind and was going to ruin my witness <laughs> and, uh, and all of that. And so, um, but I thought this would be necessary. And I know for us and me and Ashley in my marriage, being home with two little kids, I pray for everyone that has two little kids in this pandemic year. Everybody has the difficult in, in, in their own way, but God, having a four-year-old and a two-year-old during all this uh, is is words I can't say right now. Um, and then we had COVID back in the summer and, and then being quarantined for a month. With, anyway, pray for us. I'll pray for you anyway with, with little kids. <laughs> but I thought conflict would be necessary. Um, if, if some of y'all know, Ashley, she shared this uh, before with y'all that she grew up in a family with, I mean, both of her parents have been divorced multiple times. And so she had this negative view of conflict. Um, that she had this, grew up believing that conflict was bad, grew up believing that conflict only led to negative outcomes based on divorces um, that she's been through with her, with her, with her parents. And um, not only that, her personality, she's more of a harmonizer. She's a six on the Enneagram for all you Enneagram nerds. And so, um, and so she doesn't necessarily welcome conflict as much. And she always thought it was bad. Um, so we had to relearn this, unlearn some things um, in our marriage and learn some new things. Um, and I'm at five minutes. I'm trying to keep my eye on the clock, Walt. I'm, I'm going to get this an under 10. Um, but we wrote this down from the Gottman Institute. Um, and, and they say this, in unstable marriages, perpetual problems um, will kill a relationship. So you have typically solvable problems, so problems that are easy to solve, and then perpetual ones. And these perpetual ones will can literally kill the relationship. Um, and oftentimes what leads to divorce. 
um, is this when we, we, we don't address things, we have the same conversation over and over, we become what's called gridlocked. Um, you become entrenched in your problems and unbudgeable. You make no headway in conversation. The conflict makes you feel rejected by your spouse. I don't know if any of you have felt like that this year. And eventually you disengage from each other emotionally. And this is when you're in the danger zone. Avoiding conflict over a perpetual problem leads to emotional disengagement. The couple's trust in each other and the relationship declines as they become increasingly trapped in the negativity. As the gridlock worsens, they each come to feel that the other is just plain selfish and cares only about him or herself. They may still live together, but are on the course toward leading parallel lives and inevitable loneliness. And loneliness is the death knell for any marriage. Um, and so we are going to tell you, even in 2020, not to avoid conflict as painful and as weird and awkward as it can be sometimes, but to embrace it, that we think conflict is a necessary means to an end. It is a vehicle indeed. There can be no peace without it. I know that seems opposite, that conflict creates a, a lack of peace. That is not a lack of peace, but that's not true. There is no peace without conflict. You want peace in your marriage? Well, there's only one vehicle that takes you there, and that is through conflict. Well, there's probably multiple vehicles, but we think conflict is a main vehicle that takes you to peace. If we sit in it, the conflict, drive around, it can lead us somewhere. It can actually lead us to what we're all hoping for in marriage, what we believe marriage in marriage we want, in life we want, in marriage we want, and that is intimacy. Intimacy. John says in John, John 17, 3, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God in Jesus Christ. Knowing, that's what intimacy is to us. It is knowing the other person and being known by the other person fully warts wrinkles and all like intimacy i used to if, if, if i had heard that in high school somebody used the word intimacy i would have snickered thinking they were talking about the bedroom the bedroom is the product of an already existing or non-existing level of intimacy uh we have this triangle i can't remember if i drew this at a marriage conference or not but if you just picture a triangle and intimacy is the top of the triangle so we're trying to get to intimacy and the only way to get there we believe so many people try to get to intimacy by exotic getaways gifts alone uh all these whatever i mean you name it like we try to get to intimacy in all kinds of ways but we believe if intimacy is the, the triangle if intimacy is the top of the triangle the way to get there is at the bottom two points of the triangle are vulnerability and confession vulnerability and confession so the, de de the degree of intimacy that you experience in your marriage will be directly determined by the degree of vulnerability and confession that you have in your marriage. Intimacy cannot happen without an increasing and growing an intense level of vulnerability. So have the mental picture. If intimacy is the destination, conflict is the vehicle that gets us there. It is an extremely vulnerable thing to engage in loving conflict, but it has to happen, y'all. It has to happen. I don't know any more vulnerable, there are not many more vulnerable things that we can do and engage in loving, kind, respectful conflict. And if we want intimacy, which we think that is what we all want, all of us, especially those in relationships, it's gonna have to happen through conflict have to happen through conflict, being vulnerable through conflict. So I'm, I'm wrapping this up now. Uh, over this holiday season, right? Thanksgiving, Christmas, I hope we're all safe. Um, but over this holiday season, which naturally breeds conflict, right? <laughs> At least for us, lots of conflict. Let's roll up our sleeves and engage in some conflict. Maybe there's some conflict that you know, even now as I've been talking, that you need to have. Let's do that. If you need to ask some friends to sit in with you to make it healthier and better, do that. If you need to ask a pastor, do that. Ask them. If you need a, need a therapist, ask me <laughs> or another therapist. I know plenty of good ones. However you do it, do it in love and do it soon. No more delaying. Jesus says that we shouldn't let the, the sun go down on our anger. I don't think he means a literal sun um, because sometimes... 
if we have, or we're starting to have conflict at night, the best thing I can do is go to sleep. But re-engage the next day. He means do it soon. Do it soon. Fruit, there's one quote, I don't know who says it, I'm sorry. Fruit doesn't grow on mountaintops, it grows in valleys. Um, again, thank y'all. I know this was uh, 11 minutes now. Walt, I apologize for it being a little bit longer. But we really do love y'all. And me and Walt and Chris are talking about ways that we can be uh, have more of a relationship together more consistently. And I can't wait um, for those days. And I really think they're going to happen um, in 2021. And we're excited. Um, I can't wait. I can't wait to see where this goes. But um, God bless y'all. Y'all stay safe. And happy Thanksgiving. Merry Christmas. And we'll see you soon. Um, so you may be thinking, well, we're in a pandemic. Uh, we've obviously kind of put the whole community center addition, kind of what we want to do with that to the side. And, and actually, nothing could be further from the truth is that we're actually pressing forward even harder with the idea that we need uh, to continue to grow. And what we've been doing in 20, really 2019 and 2020 um, is that we are establishing what we're called community anchors. So there's going to be community partners that are going to be a part of that community center. Uh, and Hopetown Counseling is one of those. And so in 2021, you're going to be seeing more of Zach and we've got some other anchors that you're going to be hearing about um, because ultimately when we when we expand or do whatever God calls us that we want to do that is that we want you to understand that it's just not that we're adding so we have more space on Sunday morning but it truly is the idea of how can we bring um, hit experience of whether it's counseling or whether it's uh, creating spaces for families to hang out or partnership uh, with uh, with uh, DSS or other foster care and adoption agencies how can we continue to do that and so we're really excited about 2021 and, and what that's bringing. So to piggyback kind of what Zach said, again, the idea that we can't have peace without conflict. We can't have peace without conflict. I want to talk about what is it like to ha have a happy marriage? But in order to have a happy marriage, we've got to have a holy marriage. And that's kind of where we're going uh, to finish this up. So the idea is this, as, as we, a lot of us heard growing up, uh, is, is the idea is, is that marriage is nothing but a ball and... Man, some y'all, some of y'all know that really too well. Okay, some of y'all, y'all been given that advice, right? Like the, the ball is nothing but a ball, ball and chain, or the idea of going, go, don't get married yet. You need to sow your wild oats uh, because the idea of once you get married, it's a destiny. It's you're you're trapped for fifty years, and you're in the no fun zone, um, and that's kind of how the world has told us, and that's even the counsel that we've been giving in marriage, or the idea that if you get bored, or it gets hard, or you get overwhelmed, or heaven forbid. Uh, you find out that you married someone who wasn't perfect, uh, that you, there's just a back door and you can just leave. And, and that's what the marriage tells us when we, get, the world tells us that marriage is as good as long as you get what you want. And, you know, when, when couples come to me and we do some premarital counseling, you know, I tell them like, hey, you ask the question, why are you guys getting married? And, and they kind of look at me and obviously the answer is to be happy. And I often say, if you're getting married, if you're getting married to be happy, then you are getting married for the wrong reasons because marriage will not make you happy. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right. Again, the idea that, look, if that's your goal of marriage, marriage will quickly, uh, it'll quickly uh, end up not the way that you want it to. But ultimately, marriage is not about happiness. We would say it's about holiness. And that comes from a book called Sacred Marriage. It's one of the books, resources we have out there. One that's really shaped my view of marriage and what I believe marriage is meant to be. Well, Walt, you're telling us that I'm not supposed to be happy in marriage. I'm supposed to be miserable in marriage. No, that's not what I'm saying uh, at all. But if, mar if, if marriage is just about happiness, happiness, then we're cursed from the beginning because 10 out of 10 marriages, stats have showed 10 out of 10 marriages, 100% of marriages are made up of sinners, right? Yeah. Amen. All right. Don't nudge the person beside you who's the more sinner in this marriage relationships. But the idea is 10 out of 10 marriages are made up of sinners. Therefore, your, your, your partner, your spouse will sin and they may even sin against you, which will not make you happy. I can tell you that, that my wife is not always happy with me. All right. I can tell you that I am not always happy with Betsy or what she may say or what she do. And there's that conflict that we have to work through. Now, does that mean we don't have a happy marriage? No. I would say we do have a happy marriage. But our goal isn't just to have a happy marriage. Our goal is to have a holy marriage. And so that's how, well, how do we do that? If that's our goal, it, it, it is the idea that we're just not meant to be happy, but we're meant to be holy. 
Because here's the deal. If, if we do that, it takes the stress off of you. The idea that you were meant to be perfect because you're a sinner. You can't be perfect. That's why we want Christ to be the center of our marriage. All right? It's not me and my perfection that I'm going to get everything right, that I'm always going to put the toilet seat up. We're still working through that. We're going to counseling for that. Or the idea uh, that, that you do the laundry the right way or that, that you always get what he wants at the grocery store. Whatever it may be, that conflict that might be in there, the, the, the pressure's taken off you because ultimately it's not about just being happy in your marriage, but what it looks like to be holy. And so as we talk about that, the best way to have a happy marriage is to have a holy marriage. And the way to have a holy marriage is, is in my, I believe, one word is in, it's in worship. And the idea of us and what we worship. So that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time on. Of what does it really mean to be and have worship? So let's turn to John 12, 1 through 8. This isn't a quote-unquote traditional marriage passage. Uh, you're going to see a single woman uh, who does something like, well, she's not even married. What does that have to do with us? But what we can learn is what her, her worship reveals uh, in our everyday lives. So we're going to be in John 12. So if you're, if you're at home, go ahead and open up your Bible. You'll see it up on the lower end of the screen. Or if you have your app, you can go ahead and open up an app. But we are in John chapter 12. So a guy named Lazarus is uh, earlier on, he has died, uh, that Jesus actually goes and hangs out with his family. And four days later, it says he stinketh, but he actually rises up from the dead. Jesus brings him out of the grave. Um, and so this amazing miracle has happened. Now they've gone to his house uh, for lunch, because that's what you do. After you raise someone from the dead, you go and eat with them. All right, so here we go. Verse one, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary, therefore, so there's Lazarus, the older brother, Martha, the older sister, the youngest sister is Mary. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. That's important. If you're underlining, highlighting, uh, go ahead and underline that. We're going to come back to that. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he was about to betray him slash hater, all right? He said, he said, why is this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this, not because he actually cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charged the money bag, he had used to help himself to what he had put in it. Verse 7, Jesus said, leave her alone. So that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. So we have this single lady who's pouring out very expensive oil on the feet of Jesus. This is, this is an act of worship. This is a very holy moment. All right. Now, this was very expensive. It says, uh, if you read your footnotes of your Bible or you have a study Bible, it probably told you that this was worth maybe one, probably one year's wage. So if we just kind of translate that to today, uh, the median income, which when we started the church was 40000 here in Fountain Inn, is now up to 60000 in Fountain Inn. And so we're moving on up in the world. But $60,000 is essentially what she has just poured out on Jesus' feet. Now, Judas... Remember, the betrayer kisses Jesus on the uh, cheek and then gets him arrested. Judas gets all up in arms going, why didn't we just pour this in? Why didn't we give this to the poor? A lot of us church people would say the same thing. We're going, hey, why is, she, why is she wasting this money on your feet, Jesus, when she could go feed the poor? And it's even a reminder for me, because that's normally where I go, that there are some things that we need to put priority over. And yes, taking care of the poor is important, but Jesus says worship is more important. That there will be caring for the poor will be an overflow of our worship. So she takes this very expensive, uh, this expensive perfume and she puts it on Jesus' feet. Now, here's the question I ask, and you may not ask, but you may, are going, why is a single woman, she doesn't have a husband to, to, uh, that is providing for their family, and, and we believe that her family, her mother and father are deceased. Why? Because Lazarus seems to be the head of the household. 
And Martha is running the household. So there's no mother figure. There's no father figure. There's an older brother. And the older brother was responsible for his two younger sisters who are not yet married. So many scholars believe that her father in, in, in his estate left $60,000 as a dowry for Mary's husband. So in that day, that when young women would be given over to marriage, a, a young man would come and they would ask the father, hey, what is the dowry or what are you giving me? To, to, to marry your daughter. And so Lazarus would have been the one who would have done that. But she goes and she gets it and she goes, hey, I know where he keeps that. And she goes and she puts this at the, on the feet of Jesus as a sign, as an act of worship. Now notice that, that Mary gives her best and when we talk about worship, it's not the idea that it's just we're singing songs and praying prayers, but the idea of worship, and, and this is something when I was a youth pastor and even to my kids, I try to simplify it as best as possible that I, I still use today of worship isn't just singing songs, but, but worship is making God smile by, with, with what you say and what you do, making God smile. So that's what worship is. And so this not only makes the Father smile with this act of worship, of sacrifice, but it also makes Jesus, Jesus smile as well. And, and in this action of giving her best, not giving the leftovers, this is important. This indication is that her future husband is not as important as her present Savior. Now, some of you are not married. Some of you are in middle school and high school, maybe in college, or, or, or maybe you, you, you had a first marriage and you're kind of waiting for that next person the idea of, if you need to hear this, is that are you worshiping in a way that reveals your present Savior is more important than your future spouse? Because when we worship like that, before we get married, we are tilling the ground and we are, we are creating a, a strong foundation of marriage because we're seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then God may send in his timing and his will that person to do life with, to, to merge our two stories together. But if we wait for that person, well, I'll start worshiping Jesus then, then we're slow. And Jesus said, no, I don't want you to ever slow down. I want you to keep going and I'm gonna send someone with you. So if you're here today and you're like, well, this isn't a marriage series, I'm not married. This is key, that she wasn't married, but she still worshiped with all of her heart, soul, and mind, that vertical relationship. And so she was saying, look, my present, my, my present savior is more important than my future husband. And her, over, her worship overflow, it, it says it filled the entire home, the fragrance. Remember I told you to, to circle that. It filled the entire home. So everybody knew what she had done. If we desire a happy marriage, we need to have a holy marriage. And we see that that happens throughout Scripture. We go, man, again, holiness is all about walking in worship, making God smile, making God smile. So let's start here. Let's get, let's get applicable. Let's get say, hey, what does this mean for my life here, 2020? It, it, let's first ask this question. Is your life making God smile? Are you doing what he created you to do, which by the way is to worship him? Are you making him smile in your everyday life? Does he look at your life and go, well done and good and faithful servant. Well done with those resources. Well done with that parenting. Well done with that job. Well done with being on that team. Well done. You were reflecting me. You were being, as, as scripture says, you're being an ambassador. Well done, good and faithful servant. Making him smile. Well done and waking up early. Well done and staying up late. Well done in sacrificing, bringing your first fruits to worship. Now, fast forward that into your marriage. Is, is your marriage, is it attractive? Does God say, man, you are getting it done, that you are reflecting of me to your spouse? And not only that, is, is it attractive to other people? Do people go, man, I want that marriage? Not because you've got it all figured out, but because there's intimacy, there's confession, there's peace. There's understanding of going, man, they don't get, man, they're not perfect, but man, there's, there's a smile on their face. They, they learn how to, to, to handle conflict well. They're generous. They're, they're, they're raising their kids in the way of the Lord. Is your marriage an act of worship? Are people seeing that and they desire that? Are there younger couples who go, man, when I'm 50, I want that. Or when I'm 60, I want that. When I'm 70, I want that in your marriage. So again, are you giving God your leftovers in worship? Another applicable question. You just kind of give, well, when, when, I got a, uh, when I got some extra time, I'll, I'll worship. When I got some extra time, I'll read scripture. When I get some extra time, I'll go to church. When I, I get some extra time or extra money, then I'll, I'll give to the church. Are you bringing your first fruit of waking up every single day saying, God, today is your day. I am going to give my first fruit and I'm going to live for you today as an act of worship. 
So what does that look like? Heart, the things that you're processing. So remember, if we, if we don't get those vertical, uh, vertical relationships right, then the, it'll all, the horizontal will always be off kilter. The horizontal will always be uh, off kilter. And, and there's no doubt in that room who Mary worshiped. There was no doubt. He, she obviously didn't worship Lazarus, even though he'd been raised from the dead. She didn't worship her older, bro, uh, older sister, which she was a workaholic. There was a little tension there, by the way. But the understanding of going, she worshiped Jesus and everybody knew it. It's one of the things I've been thinking about even this week. It, it, it says that the, the fragrance filled the entire house. So because of her worship, everyone was touched by it. So here's the question I have for you. Are you worshiping in such a way that one, everybody knows that, that you love King Jesus first and foremost. We said this earlier, the idea that you should actually love Jesus more than your spouse and your spouse should know that and that, you're, that you're, your kids should know that you love mama and daddy more than them. That number one is King Jesus. Number two is that spouse. Number three can be your kids or whatever else. That they go, you know what? Mama, has, mama and, and daddy have been united together and there's nothing that can separate us apart, even you rugrats, okay? We love you, Rugrats, and we're gonna raise you guys. We're gonna raise you in the way of the Lord. But mama and daddy was King Jesus. I mean, we're chasing after him together and you guys are gonna go and there's gonna be a time where we're gonna send you guys out and you're gonna have your own families and God's gonna unite you. But mama and daddy, we're together on this. And we're one team. And the understanding, does everyone know that? That you love Jesus, number one? But then how does your act of worship affect others? Does it touch other people? And I'll be honest, most of us can say, yeah, but it's not positive. Most people are touched by our worship because they be knowing who we cheering for on Saturday. Because we wrap the swag, we set aside four hours on a Saturday, we set aside hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars. They know the quote unquote team we worship with all of our heart, with all of our soul and with all of our minds. They know our hobbies. Are, if it's not a team, it might be a hobby. They, they know the things or the stuff. They, they know what we talk about. But why? Because we talk about there's an overflow of the things that we worship. It's a natural. We don't have to force ourselves into conversations about the things we worship. Because inside of us, we were created to actually be great worshipers. The only thing is we normally worship the wrong things. That in our very DNA, God said, I want you to worship me. And so it's built in us to be worshipers. So it's not if we worship, it's what we worship. And then that ultimately equals to quote unquote happiness. But here's the thing, is God created us to worship and worship him. And that if we follow what he gives us, man, life is really good. He says, look, if you put me at the center of your life and you worship me, Happiness will come because there'll be an overflow of the relationship we have. And your marriage may be on the rocks, but guess what? You still got me. You may lose that job, but guess what? You still got me. Sickness may come, but guess what? You still got me. If you put me at the center of that, guess what? It's gonna work out. Worship, holiness, happiness. But what we like to do because of sin, by the way, we like to put me at the center of that and we begin to think, you know what? me and my desires and my wants, and sure, we'll sprinkle some Jesus in there, but understanding going, it's about me and what I want in my marriage, about the finances and stuff that I want and the things that I worship. But ultimately, those things will not make us happy. They will leave us broken. And so, you know, that first marriage didn't work out, so I'll figure it out. My second one, guess what? That didn't work out. And it seems to be not the person I'm marrying, but it seems to be me. It's not that job that continues to not bring me happiness, but it seems to be me. It's not more stuff, because I always want more stuff. And it's not enough money in the bank account. There always seems to be more. Nothing seems to make me happy. Why? Because the things that we're worshiping, me, can never bring me happiness. It has to be he. And some of us have been in, a, in, in a church our entire lives, and nobody's ever told you this, so let me tell you is that what you worship is ultimately where you get your identity. And what you get your identity from is what brings you hope and happiness. So if it's ultimately in, in, in Christ, then my identity is in Christ. And it's not what the world tells me, it's what Christ tells me. And ultimately my happiness comes from the holiness that I find in and through him. But if, my, if I worship my spouse and my spouse sins, they might, they're going to leave me hurt and broken. 
because I worship them. I ex have expectations of them. If it's my kids, and some of us worship our kids, and if that's what we have at the center of our lives, and our identity is in through them, and we gotta make them act right, because if they don't act right, then that's not gonna bring me happiness. And if they don't do get good grades, and they don't do, and, and if I, they don't live up to my expectations, they won't bring me happiness or my job, or my stuff, and we can fill out all the things of the world that we worship, but ultimately, if those things, my identity is in finances, then guess what? My hope is in getting more money. If it's in influence, if my identity is in influence, then it's about what other people say about me. We can spend all day about all the understanding of, look, if, if my identity isn't in Christ, I can tell you probably what it is. Show me your calendar, show me your checkbook, and I'll tell you what your identity's in. Those two things. Show me your calendar and show me your Show me your checkbook and I'll guarantee you I can tell you what's on that throne. And that's hard to hear. But we'll never have happy marriages unless we have holy marriages. We'll never have holy marriages unless he is at the center of what we worship because we were created to worship him. And when we do that, we're, when our worship is centered on Christ, like Mary, remember Mary's identity was in Christ. So everybody knew who she worshiped. Everybody knew what she was about and everybody was touched by her worship. So if we do that, then no matter what happens at my job, my foundation is still in Christ. No matter if my marriage is going well or is struggling, my identity is still in Christ. No matter what happens to my kids, whether they're in kindergarten or they're a prodigal son or daughter, guess what? My identity is still in Christ. There's a, there's a song that said, in Christ, my solid rock I stand. All everything else is sinking sand. So will our foundation be in Christ? Because when it's in Christ and what we worship and worship him alone, making him smile by what we say and by what we do. Is that what it looks like in your life? Is that what it looks like in your marriage? Are you just coexisting? Are you just going through the motions? Or maybe you're giving God just your leftovers. What was it like to live like Mary and see that she says, you know what? My present savior is more important. And that act of worship in her heart overflows and touched everyone else. Happiness comes from my holiness, which is about who I worship and how I worship. Happiness comes from my holiness, but it's all about who I worship and how I worship. So here's your big idea. Again, there was really no points today. It really was just this idea of looking at worship and looking at the idea of having a, whole, a happy marriage is understanding having a holy marriage. And that comes from, the again, what we worship, who is in the center of our lives. Here's the big idea. From this day forward, we will strive for peace through conflict and happiness through holiness. You know, this morning, Zach told us, he said, look, in order to find peace, we've got to go through conflict. And that's challenging. And we don't normally want that. We want peace without the conflict. And can I tell you, we want the, whole, we want the happiness without the holiness? We, we, we don't want to have to, to, to conform to what Christ tells us to do. We don't want to conform with to parent the way Christ tells us to parent. We don't want to conform to the, the way to use resources and generosity the way they do. We, we want to control that. So we want peace without conflict and we want happiness without holiness. But ultimately, we can, Scripture would say we can't have those two things without the others first. And so here we go with the idea of going, look, where do we find happiness? It ultimately comes from where we worship. How are we worshiping? What does that look like? And we're heading into a time of thanksgiving and hopefully that's gonna be an overflow and you're gonna be thankful for all the Lord's blessed you with. We're going into a time of, of Christmas and Advent of preparing and, and understanding. Are you worshiping more of what you get or what you've been given? What does it look like for you to worship even in these holiday seasons? And that's, that's been our hope. Obviously, we haven't been able to fix everyone's marriage in four weeks, but we hopefully we've given you a little bit of hope. And your hope isn't in your spouse, it's in Jesus. Hopefully, we've given you some tools. I understand the tools aren't on the shelf of Barnes & Noble, but it's in Scripture. Of understanding of what it means to, to really chase after God. Because we said, look, a healthy marriage is healthy because the two people in the marriage, the two spouses, they decide they want to work on it every single day. They want to avoid conflict to find peace. They want to avoid holiness in order to find happiness. But they say, hey, we want to run into that. And, and the idea they're going to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, Matthew 6, 33. We encourage you to go back and memorize that. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Verse 34, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about that, that future husband because you know what? Right now, my present savior is more important. 
or the idea that we're going to weed out the things that are choking out the life in our marriage and we're going to plant the seeds of, of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what a marriage should look like. They're full of humility and sacrifice and service. Or the idea that, look, the understanding that, that we're going to trust one another. We're going to have follow through, our yes be yes and our no be no. We're, we're going to have humility, not pride when we go into our marriage. And we just don't want a normal marriage because yes, you can have a quote unquote normal marriage, which, which stats would show that 50% actually do end in divorce. And, and even in the pandemic right now, we're seeing a, a rise of 30% of, on top of that, that file for divorce because they're not dealing with the issues. Now our, our prayer is that we don't have quote unquote normal marriages here. We have Christ-centered marriages. That's our hope. That's our prayer. And again, we can't change the last five years of your marriage. We can't change the last six months and what you said, and you were stupid, sorry. We can't change that. But from this day forward, we're gonna work to have a Christ-like marriage. We can't change what happened before, but we can change what our future looks like. If you just continue down the broad path like everybody else that leads to destruction, or you go down this narrow path that Jesus says is difficult, it narrows the way, but it is there that leads to eternal salvation. It is there that leads to holiness. It is there that leads to happiness. That's what it means from this day forward that we're gonna commit to that. You're not gonna do it by yourself, by the way. You're gonna need all of us to help you. You're gonna need some of those attractive marriages and look at and, and hang out with them. And you're going to need people to point you to devotions. You're going to need community group to, to walk through those challenges together. You were never meant to do this by yourself, but from this day forward, would you say, you know, what? we're going to commit to that and do the work necessary in that. So it starts with that vertical relationship, love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And there's an overflow of that worship that's going to touch everyone in the home. It's going to touch your kids and your spouse, your neighbors, your coworkers, your teammates, fellow students, when we say, you know what? From this day forward, I'm gonna seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto me. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now just simply thanking you. God, that you take the stress off of us because it's not the idea that we are meant to be perfect in our marriages because we are not, we are sinners and our spouses cannot handle the burden of being perfect either. But God, but we worship and, and we put the, the one who was perfect, which is, which is Christ at the center of our marriages. That's why we need you to be in our love story. It's why you need to be the centerpiece of our marriages. So Lord, I pray for those right now who, who need that. They needed to hear that. That some of them are just struggling. They're wondering why they can't find happiness, but ultimately they don't have any of you in it. There's no holiness in their marriages whatsoever. So right now I pray they would confess that to you, Lord. They would, as a couple, admit that they need to get you there. Lord, I pray for those who are doing well in their marriages. I pray that, uh, God, I pray that they would just, an overflow of their worship, an overflow of just the goodness that's coming from them figuring it out. And I promise you there has been conflict that has been there that has led to that peace. That there's, there's holiness that leads to that happiness. So Lord, I just pray, I, I pray that we as a, a gospel community would not be known for the conflict uh, that we avoid, God, but that we would lean into that for the holy marriages we desire. And so that people would see, man, there's something different about that church. There, there's something different that, that they're real, that their marriages are real, but it's something that we long for. Ultimately, because it's, you're at the center of our, our marriages. You're at the center of that. And so God, I just pray that we would be passionate about seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness. And that along the way, we find these partners in marriages that, that unite our hearts and souls. And together we become from what we're just pretty good worshipers to what we're really created for, to be one worshiper together for your kingdom and for your glory and for your majesty. In your son's holy name we pray, amen. We'd like to say thanks for hanging out with us this morning and worshiping with our Capstone family. Just to remind you of what today's big idea was from our message was, from this day forward, we will strive for peace through conflict and happiness through holiness. And the idea that if we're going to have a happy marriage, we have to have a holy marriage. And the only way that happens is through worship. So asking that question, how are you worshiping? Are you making God smile in what you say and what you do? Is, is God smiling through your marriage and, and what you are producing in your homes? If you'd like to have more questions or follow up with more, uh, you can make sure to uh, go to our Capstone app 
and you can click on Capstone to, uh, Digital Discipleship, and there you'll see uh, Gathering Insights. We have some more questions, some more things for you to follow up uh, during the week. A couple of announcements we want to let you guys know about is our Christmas shop. Uh, our Christmas shop is our partnership with our uh, Fountain and Kid Enrichment Center uh, and with Fountain and Elementary that we are providing a Christmas shop uh, for the families of our community that are in need. Uh, we have a way that you can help. Uh, if you would like to donate gifts, you can go to the Amazon link that you will see on social media this week, and you can just simply click on that, and there will be a list and a shop there on Amazon. Just simply click that, purchase it, and it will be shipped right here. And on December 5th, we will have that shop here. And if you'd like to donate, uh, not only donate, but if you'd like to serve and volunteer, you can do that uh, there on December 5th. And we will have a sign-up genius step for areas where you guys can help from being a personal shopper to help set up, to help clean up, to help wrap, um, and lots of different areas that you can do that with our Christmas shop. This Wednesday, uh, Wednesday at 6.30, you'll want to make sure to tune in. Uh, we're having our Thanksgiving community worship service. Due to COVID, we were not able uh, to do this in person, uh, but we will be doing it online. And it's just a special time where area churches come together uh, to sing to, to sing and worship, uh, but not only worship through song, but worship through scripture and through prayer, prayer and fellowship. And so we hope that you'll be able uh, to join us for that. And next week, we start our Advent series, All I Want for Christmas. So we're really excited. So next week, when you come in, we're going to... Uh, you tune in, you're going to see uh, Christmas set up all on stage and throughout uh, here on the campus uh, as we start this All I Want for Christmas series. So we want to make sure and invite you uh, to that series, whether that's here in, uh, online or whether that is on, in person at 601 Fairview Street. We hope that you will join us. So you can check out all this week. There's going to be lots of stuff on social media and on our website, capstonechurch.net, and we hope to see you soon.